Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final general session of our 2020 PNA CAP Virtual Annual Conference. We hope that you enjoyed the many sessions and institutes that we offered over these past three weeks. I'll be honest, when the coronavirus pandemic forced us to cancel the in-person conference, I wasn't sure what we could do. We'll be to a virtual event and reorganizing more than 80 workshops and two plenaries in such a short time seemed almost impossible. But we wanted to bring you the best experience and best training possible, so we forged ahead. And the response has been incredible. More than 1,700 of you registered for the virtual conference. Every training had between 200 and 400 people attending. And more than 900 engaged with NDRN and each other through the conference app. We couldn't be more pleased that so many of you were able to participate. After each annual conference, even in the virtual environment, I'm left with a deep sense of gratitude for the incredible work our network does with and on behalf of people with disabilities. You truly make a difference in so many lives every day. Thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you do. The focus of our discussion today is voting rights. We hear from a variety of speakers working to strengthen our electoral system and empower voters. For our part, NDRN is taking a two-pronged approach. We continue to support PNAs and advocate at the national level to ensure polling places are accessible and that people with disabilities can cast a vote privately and independently. But we're also working to uplift the power of the disability vote, mobilizing voters with disabilities to get active, to get engaged, and demand that elected officials support the policies that benefit our community. In January of this year, for example, NDRN issued a report called Blocking the Ballot Box, ending misuse of the ADA to close polling places. Much of this report focused on local jurisdictions that are failing in their obligation to remain accessible polling places. Some use the ADA as an excuse to close them altogether. But we also examine where things are going right, or at least better. To achieve this, NDRN partnered with the Arizona and Native American PNAs to review polling places in Coconino County. Here to talk about this collaborative effort are JJ Rico, Executive Director of the Arizona Center for Disability Law and Vice President of the NDRN Board of Directors, and Therese Yannon, Executive Director of the Native American Disability Law Center. Thanks so much for having us, Kurt. Um, Coconino County is a really diverse um, area, both as a pop population and um, by geography. Uh, it has, uh, it's home to at least four major tribal communities, including a portion of the Navajo Nation, San Juan Southern Paiute, Havasupai, and Wallapai. It also has the city of Flagstaff, uh, which includes Northern Arizona University, as well as the Grand Canyon, which presents um, some geographic barriers to voting and um, providing uh, access to election sites. Um, but it's, uh, the county is also quite large. Um, it's approximately the size of Connecticut. And um, so that also presents some barriers to providing access to polling places. Coconino County itself is even larger than other states like Maryland and New Jersey. So for those who are uh, tuning in today, kind of just to get that perspective. It's also the second largest county in the United States by area, only followed by San Bernardino, California. So for just to kind of give you a, a sense of the size of the county that we're, we're talking about today. So uh, apart from the geographic challenges, uh, were there other problems with the voting process there in the county over the years and what you discovered through the reporting? What we discovered was a, a, a a real significant lack of access to polling sites. Um, the, the access issues included everything from um, uh, gravel parking lots, uh, failure to designate handicapped or uh, parking for individuals with disabilities, failure to provide accommodations in the polling sites, um, uh, uneven walkways, a lot of um, just uneven ground in general, um, and polling sites that were very uh, dispersed. Um, people generally in our area have to travel great distances, um, even to grocery shop, and so it's not that they're unaccustomed to traveling to also vote, but um, there were very, the voting uh, sites need to be accessible when people get there. 
when we went out with NDRN staff, we even saw newer buildings that appeared to be fully accessible that had just recently been condemned due to uh, foundations cracking and, and uh, fault lines actually within the within the building. So even some of the newer buildings that had the designated parking spaces and looked to be accessible entryways and a very big boating area had just been condemned. And so again, even if upon first appearance it looked to be accessible, when we went into the building it was shared with us that that building was no longer to be used as a voting site. So following up on that, so what did the county do to try to resolve some of the issues that you identified in the report? Coconino County's recorder had been very uh, forthcoming with our PAVA director, Ronaldo Fowler, and we first met with them, which was uh, a nice segue into going on site to see what they were doing, what they were willing to do, uh, and then some of the, the changes. A lot of the things that Therese noted earlier, some of those had been fixed. Uh, unpaid parking was one of those challenges where they uh, did not anticipate having enough money to pave the parking, um, but we gave some what at least I thought were simple solutions of some substance that would make the surfaces smooth. And to our knowledge, they followed back up with our PAVA coordinator and said they were going to implement some of the kind of the surface spraying that would still maintain um, the ground without disrupting it, uh, but it'd make it a little more solid and, and a little more passable by people in wheelchairs or those using uh, walkers or other type of devices like that. So you, this is a rather unique uh, collaboration between two PNAs, both the Native American PNA and the Arizona PNA. Uh, how did you come together to work uh, on this issue? First of all, we like each other, and that that always helps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as we we've been talking about this whole uh, conference, is the PNA's collaboration is a must. And so uh, Teresa's group had already started the accessible survey, and so they had done work. Um, our our PAVA coordinator, as I mentioned before, said we needed the Native American Disability Law Center to be there as well. Um, not only because we like each other, but also they've done the work and they've also established the, the connections uh, within the community that are needed. And so sometimes we forget um, that you can't just go out there and, and just start measuring. You have to be invited. Uh, and so we knew that Therese most definitely had much more connections than we did within the communities and the tribal nations that she mentioned earlier. Uh, yet again, another PNA report triggered intervention by the Department of Justice. Therese, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what happened as a result of sharing the report with uh, DOJ. Sure. Um, as part of our um, overall accessibility project, which we're trying to improve physical access um, in Indian country and specifically on the Navajo Nation and the Hopi Reservation, um, uh, part of the project included surveying um, polling sites um, across the, our service area. So several years ago, we had a voluntary, uh, a group of volunteers um, made up of members of the community and then um, under the direction of one of our staff. And they went out and um, surveyed uh, the polling sites. One of the um, challenges in our area is that the polling sites are usually held at um, what would be the equivalent of a municipal building, frequently called a chapter house on the Navajo Nation. And um, the site is the location of both the tribal, state, and federal elections. Um, and that makes it easier for people to vote because they don't have to go to more than one site. So as a result of those, of those surveys, we developed a report documenting the barriers to voting, uh, the gravel parking lots, the um, lack of ramps, the uneven services, the heavy doors, that sort of thing. And we printed up the report and circulated it to um, all of the Navajo officials, including every member of the Tribal Council and the Navajo Human Rights Commission. The Navajo Human Rights Commission then shared it with the United States Department of Justice, which treated the report as a complaint, and it led the Department of Justice to come out to Coconino County. Um, from my conversations with the attorney who was then the head of the, um, the uh, DOJ department, or the, excuse me, the Department of Justice Voting Initiative Project, she said that they were looking at all of the counties on the Navajo Nation and they chose Coconino because it was the largest county. Um, and that led to their, um, uh, their investigation of the polling sites in Coconino County. Since then, they've also um, uh, done an investigation in McKinley County, which is in northern, uh, northwest New Mexico, uh, also part of the Navajo Nation, and Sandoval County. 
Um, and so um, because of the report, uh, they uh, did the investigations that led to the corrections that Cocomino County is currently making. Well, thank you both. This was great work and we look forward to making sure that uh, people in, in, in Indian country actually get the chance to exercise their full constitutional right to vote. Thanks again, guys. Thank you, Kurt. In 2002, Congress passed the Help America Vote Act to make major improvements to voting systems across the country. The law recognizes the unique obstacles faced by people with disabilities at the polls. PAVA also authorizes the Protection and Advocacy for Voting Access, also known as our PAVA program. Today, we honor two PNAs with the NDRN Advocacy Award for their work under the PAVA program to remove the barriers voters with disabilities face. I'm excited to announce our first award goes to Disability Rights Iowa for their work during the Iowa caucuses this year. Please join me in congratulating the entire team at Disability Rights Iowa. Hi, I'm Jane Hudson, Executive Director of Disability Rights Iowa. We really thank you for recognizing us um, in our voting rights work for trying to make the Iowa caucuses accessible and inclusive. We also want to thank NDRN and Kurt Decker for his fight long ago to get PNAs included in the Help America Vote Act so we could do voting rights work. And finally, we want to thank the administration for community living for um, continuing to support all the work of PNAs to promote full participation in the electrical in the electoral process for people with disabilities. Um, Iowa was a rural state initially in the middle of the country, corn, soybeans, tractors, hogs, but it's become increasingly urbanized. About 64% of Iowans now live in cities. And um, we have about 3 million people, 11% of Iowans have a disability. Uh, one of the reasons the caucuses has long been criticized is because Iowa um, is predominantly a state where people identify as white. 90% of Iowans are white, about 6% are Latinx, and um, about 4% are African American. I better tell you first about what the caucuses are before we start our conversation. Um, they're basically groups of neighbors getting together and voting for who they want to nominate for the President of the United States. It started out very small. In 1974, Jimmy Carter came to Iowa and lived here for a year, even put his daughter Amy in school, and the caucuses were small. They were in more kitchens and dining rooms and schools, but they become much bigger. In fact, my caucus had about a thousand people, um, and uh, because of the size, they have become a lot of challenges as well. As you know, Iowa is the first in the nation for the presidential selection contest. And that's because our state law says we have to be before everyone else. So our caucuses are on a cold evening in February. Um, very, very cold. And uh, the Republicans and the Democrats usually meet in the same area, but the caucuses are different. The Republicans actually have kind of a piece of paper they write the name of their presidential selection on and then it's counted. The Democrats are much more uh, active in, in the caucuses. Basically, um, the caucus participants go to different areas of the room that represent a presidential candidate. And then uh, we count off our votes and if a candidate has at least 15% of the total votes in that precinct is considered viable. If the candidate's not viable, then everyone mixes around and they go to the viable candidates and there's a second calling off vote and that is the candidates that are moved forward in the caucus with those votes. Now, the caucuses in the 2016 election were very crowded and they were very chaotic. Um, we started getting calls from individuals who were deaf and hard of hearing saying they couldn't find ASL interpreters or CART services for the caucuses. Um, and they didn't know how. Uh, they would call their local party, their county chair, the state party, and no one was helping them get the accommodations they needed so they, they could participate 
in these caucuses. And uh, what happened is we wrote some op-eds and we finally um, had called Senator Harkin, who was one of the initial leaders of the ADA, and um, he called the party chairs and they got their accommodations. Um, the caucuses themselves were very crowded. Uh, people were having to stand in line in the cold. Uh, there were no alternative formats for uh, same-day registration. Uh, there were no microphones. In fact, there were even no chairs. And so people were having to stand two or three hours just in order to make their selection. So we realized early on that we better start working on the 2020 caucuses um, to make sure they were inclusive and accessible. Uh, we initially explored a litigation approach, but there were some barriers. ADA Title II is for uh, public entities, and the state is very minimally involved in the caucuses. There is some involvement, but it's really run by the political parties. And ADA Title III, uh, the political parties were saying they're like a country club with members, and so that was another issue. So rather than litigating, and because uh, some of the party people were starting to work on inclusiveness and accommodations, we decided to focus on education and advocacy rather than litigation this time around. And I'm here with Annie Maddy, our communications coordinator and voting outreach person, and Emmanuel Smith, who does PAPS work and also voting outreach. Katie Vandevoord, uh, uh, another person on our voting team, uh, is on vacation today, but she's been working a lot on ballot marking tools. And so, Annie, can you tell us some of the things you did to try to educate the public and the political parties about caucus accessibility? We started in January by trying to meet with the parties to start off a year beforehand. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work, so by the middle of the year, we actually announced a billboard campaign across the state to help educate the public and the parties about the current inaccessibility of the caucuses. And the way we did that is we went out and we interviewed different people with disabilities and ask them how the caucuses were inaccessible to them and how they were able to caucus. And we put those stories on the billboards and on our website so that people could read about it, follow up and learn. And we also contacted the parties in June and we were able to meet, um, which was great. We talked about needing accommodations processes and needing people to handle accommodations processes. And we also worked on a digital ad campaign to reach people on Facebook and Twitter. My favorite method was actually the billboards because in researching them, I did get to reach out to a lot of islands with different disabilities and learn about their experiences so I could really tailor the education um, about these different experiences to the parties and to the public. So I think that that was really the best part of the project. And, and you mentioned that um, one of the political party chairs complained he had to drive by the billboard every day, so he was reminded on a daily basis. We strategically placed the billboards in high traffic areas, so that was uh, not a coincidence. So that worked to get the parties a little more attention to accessibility and inclusiveness. And now we're going to talk first about the Democratic uh, Iowa Democratic Party and what it did, and then the Iowa Republican Party. The Democratic National Committee was very concerned about inclusiveness and accessibility and even had in its rules that uh, caucuses had to be accessible to people with disabilities. So the Iowa Democratic Party made various attempts, sometimes lackluster, we felt, um, to try to make the caucuses more accessible. Yeah, so the initial idea for a phone-in caucus was that people would be able to call in instead of going to their caucus location, which seems like a great idea off the bat. However, um, the way the party was conducting it, it had quite a few barriers still. So when you would call in, you would need a special ID number, kind of like presenting your ID at the polls, which is not ideal. And then it would actually list off all of the candidates and different numbers assigned to the candidates. Now, if you're someone with an intellectual or developmental disability, that list might be too long to keep track of. And then you had to vote five times on your different preferences and rank them. So the process was long and involved a lot of listening and involved a lot of trying to remember things from the past. And it also involved pushing buttons to make your selection. So if you have dexterity issues, it's not the most ideal way to participate. 
So what we proposed to help fix these issues with different focus groups with different people with different disabilities to help uh, assess out any issues that people with different disabilities might have with the phone system. However, the party rejected this saying that the DNC needed to approve the process before they would do any testing. And unfortunately, the DNC didn't approve the process. It ended up rejecting it. So we didn't get to do any testing on that. So th that was in September of 2019. And so then they went to the satellite caucus idea to try to make it more accessible and inclusive rather than just on one Monday night in cold February where everyone had to show up in person. Emmanuel um, is going to talk about the satellite caucuses because he actually did one. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, you know, as somebody with a significant disability with chronic pain issues, with chronic fatigue, I was really excited about the opportunity of having a call in option. And unfortunately, when that was kind of put aside, um, the Iowa Democratic Party arrived at a satellite caucus model, which idea being was that you could host satellites at, at um, nursing homes and at factories and apartment complexes to give people an easier way to access the caucus process. Unfortunately, the reality became uh, where if you wanted to guarantee your ability to participate in the Iowa caucus, you essentially had to host your own. And with that came a, a lot of challenges and a lot of additional burdens that the typical caucus goer wouldn't have experienced. So for example, for mine, we had to do an extensive amount of training. We had to do a lot of planning, a lot of paperwork, a lot of back and forth emails that weren't always responded to uh, with questions and confusion. And I think it, this all kind of came to a head uh, on the national stage when we saw the issues with reporting and the lack of clarity uh, throughout the entire process. So unfortunately, while I, I think the intentions behind the satellite caucuses were good, they ultimately ended up burdening a marginalized population who just wanted to participate and not alleviating those burdens and opening up the process like we all would wanna see. So we started in January, like I had mentioned before, trying to meet with the parties to request this accommodation process. And we eventually did meet with them in June and we were promised by both parties that they would implement a request for accommodation process and have someone dedicated to responding to those requests, which was great. Um, however, we didn't see that implemented by either party until about two weeks before the caucus, which gives someone a very small window to request an accommodation, which is not ideal. So while we eventually did uh, manage to negotiate a request for accommodation process, it came really late in the game, but it did help uh, over 300 islands on the Democratic side uh, get accommodations to their caucuses, which is great. We also uh, kind of worked on some accommodations the day of ourselves. We got transportation for uh, one person. We got home health aides for another, card interpretation services, early access to polling sites um, so that people could settle in and get seated and we also got um, different uh, quiet rooms for people with different sensory disabilities. So the request for accommodation process is a great start and we're hoping that uh, if there is a caucus in 2024 that they develop that system further so it can help people with disabilities better participate in the caucuses. Yeah, and as a result of all this work, we became very visible in public as the group um, trying to make caucuses inclusive for people with disabilities. and. Um, Emmanuel and Annie and I were uh, having reporters almost two or three a day coming and talking to us because they had all come to town for the First in the Nation caucuses. And Emmanuel especially, um, what was your favorite interview and why? Um, I think my favorite interview was the one I did with The Guardian, um, with Sam Levine. Uh, not just because it was fun to do an international publication, but for two real reasons. One, um, a lot of the reporters we talked to uh, wrote about the caucus and would ask questions about the caucus in a way that kind of implied it was folksy fun and it was quaint and, and just that, you know, it was this beloved institution. And while there's a lot of more feelings about the caucus, um, the reality is it does disenfranchise a lot of people and it really does create barriers to entry. And I appreciated that he was willing to come at it from that perspective. Um, additionally, through talking with him, he really displayed an understanding that um, disenfranchisement is an, inter an intersectional issue. And that anytime you prevent a marginalized community from participating in our democracy, that's an assault on human decency. 
And so he took that comprehensive approach in how he talked about it, how he wrote about it. And I think that really showed his understanding that disenfranchisement is wrong, whether it's at an outdated caucus system or an inaccessible polling spot or through mass incarceration. So he really looked at that collective model and I, I, I appreciate his perspective. So we'd like to talk just about a few lessons learned before we end. Annie, what can you share? If you have the media explosion like we had, if you have media already around the primaries and the election coming up in November, it's a really good thing to try and redirect that spotlight just a little bit to the inaccessibility issues. Because people were already covering the caucuses, we were able to just shift the national attention just a little bit to say, hey, this is really disenfranchising people here. This is really, here's how it's doing it. Here's how it's excluding 300,000 Iowans of voting age in our state. And here's what we're doing about it. And so for the general election, what we do a lot is we work with the Secretary of State and we work with the local elections offices and we try to make sure that there are solutions, we offer advice, we monitor polling places. So shifting media attention from just covering the general election to covering what we do is something that we've been really working on and I think works really well. And Amanda, how about you? Uh, I, I think it's important to remember that it's a time not too long ago where my participation in the democratic process would have been seen as a non-issue as an absurd thing to consider, where people with disabilities were really not considered to be a political entity with, with a lot of political power. And so it's important that we as PNAs and the NDRN network remain vigilant and remain aggressive in our approach of pushing things forward and challenging all the, the ways in which um, our democracy is failing to live up to that name. And uh, you know, it's an evolving process, and I hope we can all work together to make sure that um, we're ensuring all people have free and open access to our democratic systems. Let's make the voices of people with disabilities heard in November. And thanks again for the award. We really appreciate it. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. Senator Casey is an unwavering champion of disability rights. He has introduced the Transformation to Competitive Employment Act, which would end the arcane practice of paying subminimum wage and transform sheltered workshops into entities built on the concept of competitive integrated employment. Most recently, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Senator Casey has fought tirelessly for dedicated funding, home and community-based services, to help ensure that individuals with disabilities remain safe in their homes and not in congregate settings where we have seen such a tragic loss of life. Please welcome Senator Bob Casey. I want to start today by thanking the National Disability Rights Network for this opportunity to speak to you today. And I want to say hello to all those from protection and advocacy agencies all across the country. Special greetings as well to Perry Jude Radisic and Jennifer Garman and everyone else at Disability Rights Pennsylvania. I know that you've had to change your plans for your annual meeting, and that's one of the many challenges we're facing with this public health crisis, the worst public health crisis in more than 100 years. People with disabilities and older adults have been victims of this crisis in much, much greater numbers than the general public. More than one third of the deaths from COVID-19 have occurred in nursing homes and other congregate care settings. That's why I've introduced a number of bills to address the need both for more home and community-based services as well as to ensure that congregate settings have the resources necessary to keep their residents safe and healthy. The Coronavirus Relief for Seniors and People with Disabilities Act, Senate Bill 3544, was introduced in March and much of the policy from that bill was included in the House bill that passed the House on May the 15th. Passed the House, but of course, not law yet, so we have work to do. This policy and the policy in my bill would substantially increase home and community-based funding for direct service providers, home health workers, and personal care attendants. It would also stabilize the agencies that provide direct support services and would recognize the need for additional personal protective equipment that we all know as PPE so that workers, workers 
can continue to provide services and supports in settings where it'd be less likely for people with disabilities to contract this deadly virus. I've also introduced a nursing home bill, the Nursing Home COVID-19 Protection and Prevention Act, that's Senate Bill 3768, which would provide more funding to nursing homes, intermediate care facilities, and psychiatric hospitals to ensure they can implement strategies to both uh, keep residents and workers safe and healthy. I'll work to get these policies into the next uh, piece of legislation this month of June. I hope we get a bill in the Senate, and we're going to need your help to push the Senate very hard to get any bill done, frankly. So we have a lot of work to do this month. To make these policies a reality, we need your help in demonstrating your support for these efforts to increase home and community-based services and to improve the health and safety of congregate settings. Before I go, I want to thank you for monitoring and, and, and uh, doing oversight that you do every day. All of that work is critical. You make it possible for people with disabilities to have access to services that they need and that they're eligible for and that they be treated fairly. Without advocacy and oversight, laws can be subverted and even circumvented. Your dedication to transparency and equal access for people with disabilities is a service to those with disabilities as well as to our nation. We've taken the first steps to address this public health crisis, but Congress has to do a lot more, and the administration has to do a lot more. We're not done legislating. We're not done appropriating. We've got a lot more work to do, and it's important for, for you to push us in the Congress and to push the administration to do more. Your leadership will be absolutely indispensable if we are to address these challenges to, and, and also to ensure that all Americans are kept safe and healthy during this emergency. Thank you for your service during these terribly difficult times for our nation. God bless your work, and God bless you and those with whom you work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Wyman, Washington State's 15th Secretary of State. First elected in 2012, she's serving her second term, the second female Secretary of State in Washington's history. She's known across Washington for her voter enfranchisement efforts and has been a partner to Disability Rights Washington on improving accessibility for voters with disabilities. Please welcome Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman. Hello, I'm Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman. I was so honored to be asked by the National Disability Rights Network to share my remarks on the importance of voting during the 2020 elections. This fall's general election promises to be one of our most anticipated elections in our lifetime, and I want to encourage every eligible citizen to register and vote. The global pandemic we are all experiencing presents unprecedented challenges to elections this year and uniquely affects individuals with disabilities. State and local election officials across the country are working hard to ensure every voter has access to the ballot this November while ensuring voting processes remain secure. During all of the planning officials at all levels are doing to prepare for the upcoming elections, one common thread has emerged. You should never have to choose between your health and exercising your constitutional right to vote. Here are a few things you can do right now to make sure you're ready to vote. Number one, check to make sure you're registered. Be sure to check with your local election official to make sure you're registered to vote and your registration is up to date. If you live in a state that permits by mail elections, I can tell you there are few things worse than realizing on election day, you forgot to let election officials know you moved to a new address or received your ballot or didn't receive your ballot. While we're on the subject of mail-in voting, be sure to get your ballot request in for an absentee ballot now. Election officials need time to prepare ballot materials and send them to you via mail. Don't wait until a few days before election day to make the request. Number two, if you can vote at home, do so. Protect yourself and others from COVID-19 by returning your ballot via mail or placing it in an official elections drop box. Contact your local election official to find out what options are available to you. If you need to visit a poll site or voting center to cast your ballot, be sure to wear personal protective equipment, 
socially distance, and follow the latest recommendations from health officials. Number three, look into your state's voting period. Some states like Washington allow their voters to cast ballots as early as 20 days before an election. Check to see if your state has an early voting option so you can skip the election day rush. Number four, be critical of the information you receive about elections. Only share information from trusted sources. The National Association of Secretaries of State has partnered with all 50 states and Puerto Rico to promote the hashtag TrustedInfo2020. Misinformation and disinformation campaigns seek to sow discord and threaten the very foundation of our democratic processes. If you hear or read something that doesn't seem true, ask your Secretary of State or local election official. Help us dispel myths and falsehoods. Finally, election workers are facing the possibility of the greatest staffing challenge we've ever seen in, in, our, in our collective lifetimes. Many election workers and volunteers are in the 65 years of age or older high risk bracket for contracting the virus. This could mean a great depletion of staff and resources this November. If you're able, I encourage you to reach out to your local election official and ask whether you can be paid or work for a in a volunteer position. We all play a role in the success of our democracy and conducting elections that are fair and inspire confidence. And we all want to work to that end. So be safe and remember to vote in November. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dale Ho the director of the ACLU's Voting Rights Project. As director, Mr. Ho supervises the ACLU's voting rights litigation. He has active cases in over a dozen states throughout the country. His cases have challenged the inclusion of a citizenship question on the census, documentation requirements for voter registration in Kansas, and cutbacks to early voting and the elimination of same-day registration in North Carolina. Welcome, Dale Ho. Hi, I'm Dale Ho, the director of the ACLU Voting Rights Project, and it is a tremendous pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to um, speak with you for a few moments. Um, I am delighted to um, be here with NDRN uh, and to talk uh, for a few minutes about some of the challenges that uh, we all are facing for disability rights and access as we head into November. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges with respect to voting and uh, registration separately. Um, starting with voting, I think you know everyone here probably already knows, but it's I think um, helpful to just talk about the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing. Um, just to make it plain, this is probably going to be the most difficult environment for elections administration since the 1864 presidential election was conducted during the Civil War. Um, for people with disabilities, we're talking about a, a dual prong challenge, I think. First, um, challenges to in-person voting with um, polling place closures and relocations caused by a variety of factors, including poll worker shortages. Most poll workers in 2016 were over the age of 60, and obviously a lot of people um, aren't volunteering um, this year. Um, second, polling places themselves are uh, closing. Places like schools and churches um, aren't open. Other places like senior centers can't have large crowds congregating um, there right now. And so we're seeing fewer polling locations probably uh, it, for a presidential election um, than we've seen in decades with more voters assigned per polling place in a presidential election maybe than ever. Um, last minute relocations of those polling locations, um, it's a challenge for everyone, but particularly for people with disabilities as those polling places get shuffled, um, making sure that they remain accessible to folks. Um, but then of course, a lot of people with disabilities are uh, at particularly high risk of severe complications from exposure to the COVID-19 virus which just makes in-person voting even more difficult. Um, the second problem though, with respect to voting in November that we're facing is the challenge of ramping up uh, voting by mail and absentee voting. Um, that's obviously been a focus of many organizations, including mine, but we all know that um, voting by mail um, is not accessible as it's currently implemented in a number of states 
for people with disabilities and that states are not complying with their obligations under the ADA to make those systems fully accessible. So we have a double barrel challenge. Uh, reductions and relocations of in-person voting locations, uh, many of those locations not being physically accessible, um, those locations facing potentially larger crowds um, than ever before at a time when people with disabilities are at particularly high risk of um, exposure to COVID-19. Um, efforts to account for that or make up for it by ramping up expanded mail-in voting, but those systems not being um, universally accessible in the majority of states. Um, that means we have incredible challenges ahead of us. We have to make sure that those efforts to expand access to absentee voting um, are accessible to everyone. We have to make sure that states don't rely on verification procedures like signature matching, which um, leave out people with disabilities. Um, and we need to make sure that to the extent that states do ramp up absentee voting options, they don't uh, reduce in-person voting options, safe and accessible in-person voting options, um, um, and continue to maintain sufficient opportunities in that regard for everyone. Um, that's just the voting challenge, but before we even get there, we have to deal with a major challenge to voter registration, which has cratered um, as compared to where it normally is at this time uh, in an election cycle. You know, obviously, uh, states have obligations to provide voter registration services um, at uh, any public assistance office or any office that provides um, disability-related services. Um, many of those offices are closed. Um, many of those systems have switched from requiring renewals to um, automatically extending um, people's benefits, which is, I think, a very good thing as far as people continuing to receive benefits during these particularly challenging times. Um, but my understanding is that many of the states that have switched to the system of automatic um, extensions are not offering voter registration opportunities um, that normally accompany applications and renewals for disability services. Um, obviously, voter registration drives um, are not being conducted right now. Um, so the loss of opportunities to register to vote at drives or through offices that provide disability services um, needs to be made up somewhere. Now, most states have some form of online voter registration, but again, we know that the vast majority of those systems have significant problems when it comes uh, to access. There are very few systems, as far as we know, in terms of online registration that are fully accessible um, to people with disabilities. Um, I don't have the answers to all of these problems. We've worked on all of them to a certain extent. To a certain extent. We've worked in some states on online um, registration, disability rights access. We've worked on the signature matching issue and brought claims under the ADA to make sure that those kinds of verification systems don't exclude people with disabilities. Um, but we have, I think, an unprecedented challenge ahead of us right now. And I think that underscores the importance of the work that NDRN is doing. Um, we don't have a democracy unless everyone can participate and, uh, and, and do so on equal terms. Um, and that means in order to have uh, an election where we can feel proud about uh, how it functioned, um, whether it was inclusive, whether it truly represented um, the people, um, we can't have an election like that uh, without the work of everyone here at NDRN. So I just want to thank you for the chance to um, talk to you for a few minutes and for all the work that I know all of you are doing to make sure that our democracy is inclusive in voting. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ruben Gallego, a Democratic congressman from Arizona, who's going to talk a little bit uh, to us about his concepts of how to improve voting for people with disabilities. Welcome, Congressman Gallego. Hello, I'm Representative Ruben Gallego of Arizona 7th District. I'm sorry that I can't be with you uh, in person, but of course the times uh, are calling for a little social distancing. I've been very proud uh, to work this year and help pass the PABA Inclusion Act, uh, a program that's really important to our community with disabilities 
as well as our Native American communities in the four corner areas. As we know, voting is a fundamental right. Uh, without voting, we cannot have positive change. It is these types of actions and this type of work, working with the National Disability Rights Network uh, that end up making huge transformative difference. Thank you and have a great conference. Voting is a fundamental right in American society, the foundation of our democracy. Equally important is participating in the electoral process, learning about the candidates, listening to the debates, attending town halls and asking questions. During the presidential primary, the Disability Rights Center of New Hampshire created Disability Unscripted, a video series in which staff at DRC began bird dogging candidates on issues relating to disability, campaign inclusion, and accessibility. This creative and unique form of advocacy uplifted the voices of voters with disabilities and raised the issues that they were most concerned about to the national level. For their work, I'm honored to present the Disability Rights Center of New Hampshire with the NDRN Advocacy Award. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Patrick from Disability Rights Center in New Hampshire. We are so honored to accept this award. We really wanted to take advantage of our first in the nation primary state and talk to candidates directly about disability issues uh, to really benefit people with disabilities across the United States. I'm excited to introduce to you two staff who are the core of this project. James Zeger is a staff attorney and Diodne Badurai is our communication specialist. And they did the bulk of the work on this project and they're gonna tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so Stephanie Patrick, our executive director, and this project really developed from a personal experience that I had with my family. Um, back in February of 2019, um, my husband, our infant daughter, and our five-year-old son, who has spinal muscular atrophy and uses a wheelchair, rolled into our local books, bookstore, and it's a very accessible venue. And we went to go and hear from then candidate, Senator Cory Booker. And I asked uh, Senator Booker about including and employing folks with disabilities. And the, my question itself actually evoked a reaction from the audience. My question is that with one in five Americans living with a disability, I'm curious about what efforts you have made in your campaign and then perhaps in your administration to reach out and employ people with disabilities. Woo! That's a great, that's a great question. So the video of this interaction was then shared by an audience member and they ended up tagging me in the video. And over the next few days, Stephanie, James and I saw how much reaction there, there was to the video. And um, some of our disability rights organizational allies started to share it out. And we realized that we were onto something. Um, the, the reality is that if no one's there to ask the question, the candidates aren't going to be talking about disability. So we had a responsibility to attend these events, we had the access, and we needed to start asking these questions. So as the Booker video was shared, we started to um, do some internal planning of this, what has turned out to be the Disability Unscripted video project. The next video we ended up getting was in Manchester. Um, my son and I went into a local taco shop and um, it was Beto O'Rourke and his answer to a very similar question was actually picked up by the Associated Press and then shared out by the New York Times online. What efforts have you taken to employ those, reach out and employ those with disabilities on your campaign? And what efforts would you take if you were given the chance to have an administration? And then also, what efforts are you guys taking to make sure that your stops um, on the campaign are in accessible venues like Consuelos? Consuelos. Okay. okay, thank you. Really great question. Um, one in five Americans living with a disability. Um... So living in New Hampshire, we have this unique access to literally every single presidential candidate. And we view this as a tremendous opportunity to integrate disability rights issues into the national narrative. Our thought was that if we could get campaigns to think about this early enough, they might introduce it into their campaigns to make them more inclusive and more accessible for people with disabilities, and maybe even include it in their platforms. So to that end, we sent staff over the next 18 months to all corners of New Hampshire to different campaign events.
We decided to call this project Disability Unscripted because we wanted to capture candid, unprepared responses. We did our best to avoid giving the questions to the campaigns ahead of time. We've met candidates in every venue you could imagine, from small house parties to town halls to basement libraries. We even met a few candidates just walking down the street. We tried to ask the same general questions so that voters would have a better sense about how candidates responded to issues regarding inclusion, accessibility, and improving employment for people with disabilities. The responses we got varied greatly. Some candidates shared personal stories of family and friends who had experienced a disability, and they explained how that impacted their policies and priorities. Other candidates pivoted, and they talked about issues like special education, healthcare access, or long-term care. Many candidates seem genuinely excited for the opportunity to break from their rehearsed stump speeches and talk about issues that are rarely discussed on the national stage. On the other hand, a few candidates were clearly much less comfortable with the topic and they struggled with their answers. But by the end of the project, we had recorded responses from over 22 presidential candidates, including every candidate who appeared on the debate stage. We also collaborated with a local college student who's an aspiring filmmaker, and his name is Samuel Habib. So Samuel had decided that he wanted to go and uh, meet every candidate that he could and then share these interactions out with a wide audience. And we thought this would be a really good um, way to expand the Disability Unscripted video project. So um, as some of you are likely aware, a couple of Samuel's videos did garner quite a lot of attention. And so we have actually asked Samuel to, to um, share his experience with you directly. Hi everyone, I'm Samuel Habib. Thank you for including me in the award acceptance. I asked questions of six of the candidates running for president while they were in New Hampshire and made six short videos with my dad. I was interested in meeting the candidates because I wanted to get to know them before I vote. It's important to ask them questions and to advocate for disability rights. It is important to see if the candidates talk to me like an adult and see if they have good answers about housing, inclusive education, and employment for people with disabilities. I asked Deodane to share the videos on the DRC New Hampshire social media. The video of me with Vice President Biden went viral because he stroked my face. It was important to make and share videos to get young people with disabilities to vote. It was nice to work with the DRC New Hampshire. Thank you. As you can see, Disability Unscripted was a collaborative effort. We have a lot of people to thank for their part in this project. We want to thank Samuel first for his generosity in sharing his videos with us. We want to thank NDRN, particularly the communications team, for all their technical assistance, especially with all things Twitter. We want to thank all the candidates who took the time to talk to us, and to all of our sister agencies across the state and disability rights allies across New Hampshire and the U.S. for sharing the videos with people with disabilities across the state. We're so excited that the voices of the people with disabilities have gotten more attention this year. It seems like presidential candidates are finally beginning to understand how important the disability vote is. We hope you'll all go out and add your voices to these conversations as we prepare for the November election. We're all stronger together and our voices need to be heard. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, former Attorney General Eric Holder. Mr. Holder is an internationally recognized leader on a broad range of legal issues and a staunch advocate for civil rights. He served in the Obama administration as the 82nd Attorney General of the United States from February 2009 to April 2015, the third longest serving Attorney General in the United States history and the first African American to hold that office. He currently serves as Chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Mr. Holder, Thank you for being with us today. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today, but it's still an honor to virtually be a part of the 2020 NDRN annual conference. And I hope you, your family, and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy. Now, your mission here has a, has a special place in my heart. I'm proud of the time that I spent working to defend and to expand the rights of Americans with disabilities. Every single American deserves to have a voice and it's especially important to people living with disabilities. Now, I'm not, 
We're not. We're not done fighting yet. We can't be. When I left my service as Attorney General, President Obama and I worked together to launch the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, an effort to fight one of the fundamental issues that is, that is harming our democracy, gerrymandering. Now, gerrymandering may not garner the most headlines, but there is no issue that it does not touch. But we're all facing new and daunting challenges during this global health crisis. Now, I want you to know that the NDRC is doing everything we can to protect the principles of our democracy. We remain committed not only to the fight against gerrymandering, but also to protecting America's electoral process and making sure that all voters, all voters have the ability to safely cast ballots this November. Now, we're doing the work to ensure the long-term health of our democracy, to ensure that the next decade is better than the last one, and to give power back to the people where it belongs. And when I say people, I'm talking about everyone in this country without regard to race, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. We have to ensure that we have a system in place that doesn't make the American people choose between protecting their health and exercising their right to vote. There shouldn't be a tension between the two. Allowing our fellow citizens to cast a ballot at home, at home, by using the mails will help us through this pandemic time. But it will also ensure that Americans with disabilities will always have an option to vote in a way that is sensitive to their unique needs. Voting at home should be a permanent part of the American electoral process. But we also have to provide accessible and healthy polling places so that the poll workers and those who, who want to cast a ballot in person have opportunities to do so. Again, these polling places not only have to be safe, they also must be accessible. Now, we made significant progress at the Department of Justice during my time as, as Attorney General. Our Civil Rights Division led the, led the charge and placed a focus on aggressive enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA is, is about ensuring that all Americans participate fully in our democracy, in the life, in the life of the nation. Throughout the last three decades of existence, our society has come a long way in its treatment and perception of Americans living with disabilities. And though we've seen great progress, we all know there's still much work to be done. Importantly, people with disabilities should be able to exercise their right to vote, just like any other American. Now make no mistake, make, make no mistake. There are many who understand the power of the disability community as a voting block and who work to undermine the community's access to the ballot box. It's my commitment to everyone here that I will continue to push back against those forces who want Americans to be disenfranchised on this or any other election day. Now, during my lifetime, we've made really incredible progress as a nation. We are not yet where we need to be. Our fight for equality in America continues. Our fight for voting rights in America continues. Our fight for justice in America continues. Our fight for equal access continues. It gives me hope that we're all in this fight together. And I think that working together, I'm confident that we can make this nation live up to its founding ideals and ensure equality for all in America. Let's get out there, let's change the world. Thank you all for having me here today. Lastly, let's turn to work that NDRN has done to demonstrate the power of the disability vote. It took eight debates before the Democratic candidates for president were finally asked a disability question. Considering that 25 million Americans have a disability and the federal government oversees billions of dollars in disability-related spending, why don't candidates for office take voters with disabilities more seriously? To find an answer, the National Disability Rights Network commissioned a first-of-its-kind poll to better understand the attitudes and behaviors of voters with disabilities. What we found should serve as a wake-up call to anyone running for office. I'd like to take a few minutes to present some of our findings now. Our research showed that 2020s, the disability community can be the swing vote. In 2018, there were 102 toss-up races, the House that were won by less than 10 points. Republicans won 53, Democrats won 49. In 2016, there were 42 races that were decided within 10 points. And in 2014, 56 races uh, within 10 points. 50 House and Senate races won by less than five points. Republicans won 26 and Democrats won 24. In 2016, 22 races 
were decided with less than five points. And in 2014, 31 races were decided with less than five points. The disability community is the largest swing voter group in 2020. 19 million personally disabled registered voters exist. There are more personally disabled voters than black or Latino voters, and the disability community is larger than both combined. Vote by mail and expanded AB and EV made disabled voters the fastest growing voter demographic in 2018, with even a higher growth expected in 2020. The disability community defined shows that there are 72 million adults and 19 million registered voters. Plus, the disability community includes their in, not only individuals, but their immediate family and caretakers. This is an estimate of over 150 million adults, 30 to 60 million votes who are registered voters. 20 to 40% of your voters belong to the disability community. Because disability doesn't discriminate, the disability community looks demographically and politically like the other populations as a whole. By an eight, 80 to 20 margin, the disability community says politicians don't pay enough attention to them and issues important to them. If a politician does support them and their key issues, 77% would be more likely to vote for that person. 50% would be much more likely. Most issues important to the disability community are not highly partisan or ideological. So let's do some simple math. Let's say there are 100,000 voters. 50,000 of those are Republican and 50,000 are, Dem are Democrats. If 40% of the disability community is involved, then 20,000 are with the Republicans and 20,000 are with the Democrats. 50% are potential swing voters. That means that the GOP would get 10,000 and the Democrats would get 10,000. You win half of those 5,000 vote switch, it's a 10 point swing. So the message to politicians is pay attention to the disability vote. That's enough to change every one of those 102 elections and change control of the House and or the Senate in either direction. 2020 will see a record turnout from voters with disabilities. Whether absentee ballot, electronic voting, and vote by mail expansion, we will see the fastest growing voting segment in the disability community. And social distancing could make disabled participation even easier. We need to focus on media coverage to make sure that the media understands the importance of the disability vote and its power, and make sure that in the coverage of the upcoming election, disability issues are dealt with on a full and ongoing basis. Obviously, the campaign is going to be directly affected by the COVID pandemic. With every facet of daily life changing, 2020 will be the first election ever with virtually no in-person contact between the candidates, their campaign staff, reporters, and the public. So this is going to be a challenge to everyone in the voting space, especially the PNAs enforcing HAVA and making sure the disability community is seen and heard through some incredibly important election. So as you can see, this election year has been unusual to say the least, but our role in this election has not changed. It is no different than it was in 2016 or any of the elections that have come before. Our role is to protect and advocate for the rights of people with disabilities to vote. Indeed, PNAs are a crucial part of our nation's efforts to fulfill the promise of the Help America Vote Act. We do this work because we believe that voting is the most precious right of every citizen. And we all have an obligation to ensure the integrity of our voting process and to uplift the voice of the disability community. From Maine to California, PNAs ensure people with disabilities have the same right to cast a private and independent ballot as their fellow Americans. And from Alaska to Florida, we work with election officials to adapt polling places for accessibility and train poll workers to treat all voters with respect. From east to west, north to south, and to the territories, PNAs are educating voters about their rights so that they can fully participate in this election. We do this work because we know that while there are many ways in which people with disabilities remain second class citizens, places where our voices are still not heard, on election day and in the voting booths, we are all equal. So again, thank you all for participating to, today in this virtual conference and for joining us today and taking time over the past few weeks to further your education and rededicate yourself to our mission to protect and advocate the rights of people with disabilities. Stay well, stay safe, and carry on. Thank you.